everyone. Welcome to our Seasteading Social with Pete Abrams about repurposing plastic to build communities. Pete is the developer of Plasticrete and founder of Sea Shelter, um, a regenerative biophilic floating community structure, way of building communities. So welcome, Pete, um, and take it away. Thanks, Carly. Um, so Pete Abrams here and um, yeah, so I've been working with different materials and lately I've been working with plastic and plastic film. Uh, plastic film has a very unique capabilities. It's a thermoplastic, which means that it can change um, with heat as opposed to a thermo set, which is basically like a two part epoxy um, that will um, set and you can't do anything with it. Um, and um, so a thermoplastic film is very thin and with just a little bit of heat, you can make it stick to itself. And you can take um, many, many layers of this material, wrap it around a, a form or an object and it will fuse itself to itself. And then the sand will embed into it. So you get this very hard crust on the outside and then you get um, this, the, the layers are all sealed together. Um, as I've said, I've been in um, Stanford, New York, and it's an agricultural area, and there's a lot of um, ways that they take and take the field, basically. They chop it up and they put it, they give it to the cows. And generally what they do is they want to store it um, for long-term use and they'll wrap it in a plastic sometimes called a marshmallow where they'll take very thin plastic and they'll wrap 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 the bales and they can hold them and keep them in place for a long time um, or else they have these larger silage type of things uh, you'll see a picture of a there is them wrapping the bale um, anyway there is an incredible amount of this material available um, and so what I've been doing is trying to find utilization for it. Um, so what I've done is I've taken and you wrap the many, many layers of plastic, and then you take sand or glass, crushed glass, or I've worked with coal slag or anything that can basically take the heat um, and maintain the heat. So on a microscopic level, you're taking a rock, you're heating it up, and then you're applying the rock to the plastic. The, the, the rock is going to transfer the heat and fuse all those layers of plastic together, but on a grander scale or on a microscopic scale. I can't say which. Um, so, so I have this material and I've been able to take it and use it with um, the sand. And uh, so what I've been able to do is, is take like this, you saw the pictures of the fields, the annual fields that have the plants in them. That's this black plastic. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so like this one here is this this piece here. They took a piece of cardboard. I wrapped this um, LLDPE around it and then put it in sand and it all fused together. You can see that's the first clear white layer. Um, so then I have, if a, a Carly of Jacques is trying to get in, just let him in. There's a guy named Jacques. Todd, if you can uh, send him an invite, that would be great. Um, and then, then the other layer is, you'll see there's a sand crust. So, so basically what I'm, I'm doing here is fusing these many, many layers together and creating a very strong uh, material. And, you know, here's another section of it where I took, this was just a very large green bag that, I, that was covering a pallet. This is a pallet wrap. This is LLDPE. This is a material that you see that comes in um, for uh, wrapping of pallets or anything that comes on, a, on a, a, you know, the boxes to keep it from shifting around. Um, I guess I should go back to that video I had before. Um, 
So yeah, so like there's a lot of this material available. Um, and it's just a matter of finding utilization for it. Here's one where I took and I wrapped it and then I cut it up at the end. And you can see there is, I don't know what you can see, there's basically a sandwich of this material. There's a crust of sand on the outside and the sand will give a, a real layer of protection from the elements. This stuff is plastic and it will um, photodegrade from the sun, but the sand will offer some layer of protection. Um, and that's basically it on the plastic week. Um, it's just a way to take with, you know, using low temperatures, the sand, I'm not heating it up. I'm not mixing the sand with the, um, with the plastic. I'm just heating the sand and then using the sand as a heating element. So the sand heats the form. So if this was, so this is a form that I'm, I'm going to be talking about. It's a elongated bipyramidal hexagonal prism. Got that? So here is what my idea is that you would be able to take this and make this on a scale of a size that you'd be able to live in. And then these would, would form um, basically a shelter system. Um, they can get linked together through a series of magnets. Let's see this over here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just looking at it as a, a way to create these spaces. Um, and uh, let's see. So, so the plastic tree, let me go back to the plastic tree. Uh, um, and so we can create, you know, different um, forms with this. Um, like this one here is a way to attach. I just used basically the same black mulch and wrapped it around and created a um, a, uh, a a joint. So there's many things you can do with this. Um, my idea is that you can create um, these structures and create these structures that act in tandem and create larger structures. Um, Here's this, just a, a piece of, this is a, the, um, gives you an idea of the crust that you get. The sand becomes embedded into the plastic. So you get the, all the sort of the, the great things about plastic, about its, um, you can change it, you can form it however you want. And then by using different sands or glass or whatever you have, you can get that outer crust to be very strong and uh, it'll be you know, form against the abrasion and whatnot. So you can get this really strong outer coating with the, by using different sands and different temperatures. Um, so let me see, are there any, any questions so far? No. Um, I had a question about um, about seasteading in general. Your, I mean, your overall approach to why you want to build floating structures on the ocean. Yes. What is this? What is the question? What is? Yep. I guess why why build floating structures on the ocean? Why were you inspired to do seasteading? Oh yeah, so yeah, I was going to start with a little overview of seasteading. I've um, um, for those of us who uh, aren't coming from a seasteading community, the idea of seasteading is to, I, I've uh, recently learned that whales are mammals that lived on the land and went back to the ocean. We evolutionarily wise lived in the water, came onto land, and I think it's only a matter of time until we go back to the water. I think, A, there's a lot of space out there, um, B, and I think it's just a natural evolution of us going back to the water. I think that there's something about living on the water 
um, and just floating. And I think to be able to build these ecosystems that can thrive on the water, it's not so much of like getting out there and sort of battling with nature and surviving, but I think we can build things that can actually create these just thriving, vibrant, verdant ecosystems that provide shelter for plants and animals and fish. Um, I've seen, I just see this as, as a way to create a sort of a, a, a coral reef, a reef of some sort where you have places for fish and animals to hide and attach to. The ocean is basically this desert until you find a way to get shelter. So it's not just providing a shelter for people, it's providing an ecosystem. And I think that we can take what we have and very simply create these ecosystems. Um, I don't think it necessarily needs to be out in the middle of the ocean. I think that there's definitely applications for this which are much more closer to home. Um, I see this as something that can use for coastal communities as a way to sort of step into the ocean. Um, and I don't think we need to go immediately out there. I think there's freshwater applications as well. I think there's many instances where these can be used as a sort of an aquaculture type application where you create these cells and the cells link up together and create a much stronger um, structure. Um, and why am I not being able to get this? Um, so again, here is just, why is this not, this is, please stand by, please stand by. Um, Okay, so let me see if I can't grab these. And um, so let me start with my movie. I got a movie here somewhere. I think that kind of gives you a nice overview. Oops. Somehow, somehow we got some sweaters in here. <laughs> okay. Let's start with an overview of the movie. And this is sort of a very large picture. This is a, a, you know, obviously kind of a grand scheme of things here. But the idea is that you'll be able to create these cells and the cells get linked together. And then within the cells, there's structures that pull and create this um, kind of a hub and wheel system. Um, and there's plants and there's just different ways to create spaces and um, put nature inside of it. Um, and um, yeah, this is this is obviously when you do gender, you know, CGI or whatever this is, you can make it as big as you want. But the idea that you have this large structure that can float and a lot of the structure is below the ground. Uh, Carly, someone's in the waiting room. Um, would be able to, uh, um, yeah, provide this shelter. Um, let me see. And um, and and just the idea is that you can create these these very simply. Um, and it's a very simple structure and a very simple design um, that you would be able to take a, a, hexag a hexagonal cell and outfit it with a bed, with whatever it is that you would, one person would need to be comfortable. And obviously they scale up and down and the smaller ones might only have a bed and there'll be a shared bathroom. And as they go down, they get a little bit larger and you would have a full size. Like right now I'm living in a 32 foot Pace Arrow motorhome and it has everything I need. It's got a kitchen, it's got a bathroom and just working off of that, it's like we can create these things very, very inexpensively using materials that are available, using materials that 
um, don't require a lot of energy and provide this sense of, of, of space. Um, and this is shadow coming in to just and uh, yeah, it's it's about unleashing the the human potential. If we can create islands like this, where people can live really um, easily, um, and you know, this is this is an application for the water, um, but there's other applications where you have um, less. Um, Um, and, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's basically what I see. This is a very, very stable tent, um, something that's just a way to enclose space and keep you dry and keep you warm and provide a sense of community. So you'd be able to link these things up. So if you have this one here and this one here, and then you could just continue to arc it out. This space is in between here is filled with soil and so plants would be able to grow the plants provide shade and also protect the plastic from damage um you know on this one here you see there is a much larger vision of it um i go back and forth i know probably surprise surprise i don't have all the answers and i keep moving things around this is a design I had where it's got a flat roof and the walls come out. It's about architecture in six sides. I know we're kind of used to being in a box and having four sides. And I go back and forth on whether there's a flat roof and a flat floor. A flat floor is kind of comfortable, but I'm actually been moving towards having a peaked roof and flat walls and a peaked floor. And then you just have to sort of truncate the floor a little bit so that you get this sort of floor area. But it's it's not that tough to, to make a floor. Um, and then to ways to architecturally create spaces where there are bedrooms on one side, entrance ways, and making it comfortable. Um, and obviously there's a fairly larger setup here. I have got to get myself better organized. Um, that was not in the, this is, this should be opening, open. These are random pictures. These are all just random pictures. Um, Anyway, um, I have designs for different things, but the idea is that you basically make this shape, and this shape is 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 going to be how you you see to cut it. Um, and you know, to 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 be able to to do this, and 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 then you need to be able to scale it up, and to be able to take materials that are available. And scale it up. Oh. Um, we have a question. We have a question from Kim. Um, uh, she says, I, "I know this is in the beginning phase, but what do you imagine this will cost to make per unit, and how many need to be put together for minimum structure?" Good question, Kim. Thank you. Um, if you want to do, a, I'd like to do a ring. So, if you want to have a whole ring that goes around. Right, so each one of these is just slightly arced. And if you do 36 of them, so you have a 10 degree angle there, um, that would be 36. Um, and you get this nice tight ring. Let me see if I can find that ring somewhere. Um, uh, it would be, I mean, it would be probably in the thousands of dollars to create one of these once you get it. Obviously, it's going to be scaled so that it, uh, makes sense. Where is 
So like over here, this will show how um, trying to give a presentation here. Um, so yeah, it would be probably like each one would be thousands of dollars. But if you figure that you can make a house for thousands of dollars, I mean, that would be the shell. You'd be able to, when you form it, you'd be able to put all the utilities in. You'd be able to put the lighting in. You put the plumbing in. You put the electric in um, as you're forming it. So there's, you know, you have a watertight seal all the way around. So you could put this on the ground and basically just um, channel out a V or, or um, with a backhoe, put a V and it would sit there. And then you put another one so that it, it doesn't move at a slight angle. So you could, these can be land-based. They don't have to be in the water, but I'm doing a presentation for the seasteader. So I'm gearing it more towards the sea, but I think that there are terrestrial applications where you can just have them on the ground. They don't need to be all linked together, but I that's sort of my vision is to have this sort of kind of, not that I want to make a fort, I mean, I'm trying to get away from this idea of forts, and we have this very stop it. Um, kind of a scarcity-based and fear-based shelter system. Um, I've been traveling, and I went to you know some of the earliest, earliest settlements, and they're all about protection and fortifications and protecting what you have against marauders who want to come in and take it. I think we're living in a time now where we're past that, where we have incredible resources available to us for everybody. And if we all just live simply, everyone could just simply live. Um, and so it's a way to create simple living structures that take very little to produce and very little to maintain. So that's what I'm going for is just very simple structures that take material from the waste stream, pretty much these beautiful long chain polymers that have just amazing capacities and, and are available. And you can take them and you can wrap them and create these really robust structures, really robust materials um, obviously, it wouldn't just be like this. It would be a lot more infrastructure that would go into it, and there would be some triangulation, and there would be lots of things to make it much more. It wouldn't be so uniform thickness, but the liquor box comes at a uniform thickness, so I kind of work with what I got. And so, yeah, that's that's the idea is to make very simple structures for living simply. Um, what? And I think... So we do have a few questions. I didn't want to interrupt your train of thought. <laughs> um, so I came in a follow-up question. If you had the ring of just 36 um, structures, what, does that allow for communal space? Yeah, so like, um, let me see if I got it better. So yeah, there's a communal space on the middle. So there's what I call the uh, cave common core. Um, so what you see like on the one that I had um, here, if there was just a simple ring, uh, the, the, there's a, a, if you see those uh, green and red lines, so if you could imagine them as being tension lines that are going from one cell coming off to two other cells and that those two cells connect again. So you create this triangle with these tension and those, and as it goes around, you're able to create a horizontal surface as it moves around. You'll see, I don't know if you can see the red and the green, but those are what, and they run along those the beige lines. And so that is what you're gonna use as, as intention to create this floor area. And that floor area is the common area. And then where the, 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 the tension isn't, that um, there's a core. So that gives you access to the inside. So you can look down and get light and air comes in through that core area. So there's a cave common core 
curriculum, if you will. <laughs> and then how how do you how does a person get into that structure? Question from Carol. Does a person crawl into these hexagons? Well, there's stairs. You see, there's stairs on this one. This is a, a flat top one, so they've changed a bit. But basically, there's an entrance on the inside of the from the common area, and then from the outside of the cave you have the view of the water or wherever it is. And that's the exterior space. And then, but you can still crawl around, around that area. There should be plants and so forth, but I haven't quite gotten to the full rendering on this one yet. Sure, and Colin asked, how many people do you expect for the different volume units? So, um, well, the we units change in size. At the top, they're smaller. And as they go down, they get a little bit bigger. So at the top level, it could be just a bed and a smaller area. So it'd be basically one person. I, I really see one or two people per unit. Um, as you get further down, they get so big that you have to subdivide the hexagon. So that instead of just being an open space, they're subdivided into more hexagons. So then at that point, then they get smaller and they get re-quantumed whatever. Sure. Um, and we can invite people if you want to unmute yourself to ask questions and have a discussion, feel, feel free or ask questions in the chat. Um, um, so, yeah, so I mean, as, as far as the design and construction goes, there's the individual cells are made and they're brought onto into place and one of the ways is that they're submerged in the water and they get attached from the bottom and as you can see this type of construction there is it's you can be closed up more and more on either end and so there would be an air pocket on the top here and you would fill it with water you could fill it with a combination of water silt and air if you fill the whole thing with water it'll be neutrally buoyant and you can bring it down into, into the place where it would become attached to the structure. It gets bolted on, and then you entrain air into it, and then it will slowly rise up. So you have the most of the structure is underwater, giving it ballast and, and stability, but you can raise and lower it by how much air and silt and water is in each individual cell. Um, so that's just one way to have this sort of like infinite growth as you just keep adding cells from the bottom and it gets larger and larger. So I know some of the questions are gonna be about storms and whatnot. Um, so Frank, do the pods have, I didn't make, I didn't catch that, Frank. Frank had a question, but I didn't get it in time. So do the pods have a skeleton? Plasticrete is great for connective tissue, but I feel this would need a frame of some sort. Yeah, there is a frame that, that like I said, it's sort of like this um, triangulation with, you know, these are the bones that you'd wrap the plasticrete around, leaving a hollow space or whatever. But yeah, there, it's not just this uniform thickness. There's this sort of like, structure that everything gets um, built on. Can you see my magnets, Frank? Held in with magnets. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just, uh, what else? We should do rubber structures. They covered everything. Um, and so, yeah, you create this basically this this you know communal area. So, and this community, and it can be, and like I said, it can be land based. We can build these things on the ground. Um, if they're built on the ground, and something happens, and the waters rise up, um, simply by tethering it um, with you know guy lines, and then the water comes, the whole structure can rise up out of the water. Um, as the, as the waters rise, and then they just go right back down to where they were. So it's sort of a flood-proof um, uh, housing situation. So it can work both in the water and on land where there's, you know, fear of floods. 
and mudslides. Um, let's see. Rose, flat roof, some roof. Uh, and the hexagons we see everywhere, including Saturn. Just found out today. So that's my big hexagon. It's the size of two Earths. Um, so... Colin asks, um, as this kind of seastead grows, can it be built from underneath and wider and be floated upwards? Yeah, that's that's the concept, is that you just the, the cells get slightly larger each time they get set back a little bit, they get attached. And as you put them in, there's like I said, there's there's room on the bottom part here if you put stilt. Or some sort of medium in there that's that's denser that'll bring it down, and also if there's something in there that reacts, some sort of biological agent that produces some sort of gas. So now oxygen or some sort of gas is now coming up, um, being contained in this space, pushing the water out and creating a buoyancy. So this is, could actually just be driven into place um, as if they're neutrally buoyant, attached to the shelf to the system, and then over time would produce the air necessary for the buoyancy. You want to have mostly, you know, um, negative neutral buoyancy or negative buoyancy to keep it down so there's the stability for this for this island. But the idea is also that there's growth that comes with it. So the spaces between them, as they're connected, will also provide areas for growth. So this, this area in between the, the two cells is actually going to be filled with soils. And, you know, you, you just see nature has a way of finding a place to grow. So I'm just giving it the opportunity to grow and giving it the spaces to do it. Um, and, and by taking really simple materials that are available. And you could heat the sand with the sun and get these horizontal parabolic mirrors, slowly heat up the sand and do this whole thing carbon neutral. Um, so you wouldn't even need to use any sort of really ecologically correct. Assuming all the technical issues are resolved to move them in groups, super sci-fi, <laughs> super sci-fi. That's what I'm rolling with. Huh? Um, so, yeah. so Colin and Frank are in the chat, but I know you guys know how to unmute yourselves and, and have a conversation if you, if you would, it's a little easier to do it that way. <laughs> hi, hi, sorry. This is Colin. <laughs> I didn't okay. want to derail him. Um, yeah, uh, Pete, so I had some ideas there. You had mentioned, uh, you know, as I grew further down, they'd be larger. And I was, we'd been speaking about flotation and it occurred to me is like but as they go up taller you know obviously you do have buoyancy control so you can technically bring them up and down within that water column increasing the overall height but could you move them inwards is that something that you had considered assuming the technical issues were simple which they're not but they could be i mean that would because that does change the amount of mast so to speak you know how much how much sail you've got when it's really tall so just uh just something to that it popped into my head do, do you have a thought on that thank you um let me make sure i have this right when you say move them inward if you have a dome like the, the one that's shown you're saying put the outer ones inward more uh, the upper ones so as it grows taller uh, it, it would be for the most part ballast or it'd be fairly balanced because, you know, you're essentially just creating a, a, a cone right. in the water. But yeah. the higher the cone, the more the wind resistance. And I'm just right. wondering if, if there was a thought towards 
reducing that structure or if instead of it being a pure cone to be something a little bit more like a rudder, you know, I want one of those things. That's, that's why I always love the Seasteading Institute because, you know, shapeable forms. Uh, a rudder. Just, mean, just wondering. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not quite sure. I'm just trying to understand what you're saying. Instead of being a cone, you're saying you're more straight up or just less, less um, geometric. Well, I guess the big question would be, do you expect the pattern to be static or something that can be moved in the future? You know, so that the stacking, you know, kind of like in an igloo, when blocks were moved in and inwards and outwards, kind of, and picture like the Eiffel Tower. I, I, you, you didn't get the uh, chance. You didn't see the, the text I'd sent before the one that you happened to catch. Uh, which was the question, um, the whole sci-fi thing I'd mentioned, um, that if, 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 you know, you've got these different opposing forces of wind pressure and water pressure. And I was just wondering, like, did you ever think about an adaptive structure that is above the water line for the layout? Not yet. Not yet. Um, I mean, I haven't really, I mean, I just figured as it comes up out of the water, it'll just maintain that shape. I think once it gets, like I said, oh. the cells get large enough, you need to sort of break them back up and have a multicellular cell. And again, um, I mean, okay. it, you probably want to have walls that don't, instead of just continuing out, they would sort of fractal and there would be other growth on the inside. So it's not just this continuous oh. over large side. So it, fractal on the inside and maybe fractal on the outside but i haven't i really haven't gotten that far yet okay so like in, instead of going up going outwards and creating kind of like a an, an atoll of smaller units okay that makes sense yeah thank you and also um i know we haven't gotten to it yet but there's going to be questions about waves and this thing so this is just shown by itself in the water i also see this atoll on the outside. So it's different like breakwaters, similar construction to this that will be able to take the forces of, you know, larger waves and, and whatnot. Um, any other questions? Todd, can you send Jacques the uh, link? Because he was looking for me, but I, I can't do it right now because I'm busy. I'm in the middle of a, Thank you. Um, let me see. So, I mean, it's basically I'm, I'm copying off the bees and nature, and I've, I've called it sea shelter because I see these things as being kind of reminiscent to something that I would see in the water and kind of mimicking a, a sort of a conical seashell. Um, this one is sort of a quantum layer based. We're, dealing and designing other ones that are more spiral. So they continuously grow. It's not just one row and then another, but they can just grow in this spiral formation. So you just add one cell at a time around. Um, I mean, do people feel like they, they kind of get the, the plastic creek concept about how it's not mixing sand and plastic, but I'm taking sand and heating it up. Like this one was just wrapped and I just stuck it in sand and it only got to this far. And then I cut it here and here and this didn't get anything, but this is this is basically what it is. Um, another um, illustration is that you could see here, this was just wrapped and as it heated up, just the heat and the pressure from the um, plastic fusing and cooling squoze it in this much. So this is how much the, the, the cardboard, it was this size cardboard and just by heating it and the plastic squeezing it around it, compressed all that, that cardboard like that. Um, so it's really kind of, you gotta kind of be careful when you do this because um, the edges as was where the plastic is will pull away and get much thinner on the edges and much thicker on the, the flat parts little technical bit there you might want to know about in case you're doing your own plastic cream. Um, as far as I know, um, this plastic process is environmentally correct. I don't heat the plastic enough to um, 
release any toxins or, or change the chemical composition of it at all. It's just hot enough to fuse it. So, I mean, in the plastic industry, when you recycle it, you'd have to take this, sort it, chop it up, clean it, melt it, pull it into these long strands and then cut it up again into these nurdles in order to be reused. It's a very labor intensive, energy intensive process to recycle plastic, especially plastic film. Um, this process kind of cuts out the middlemen altogether and you just take the material as it is. Um, and like I said, this agricultural plastic has really no um, secondary use utilization. They don't have anything they can do with it because there's so much, this stuff is like 50 pounds an acre when you put it out there, but when you pull it up off the field, it's about 200 pounds an acre because there's all this dirt and debris that's on the, the plastic. And it's really very, very difficult to clean it up enough to actually be able to utilize it or recycle it. So what happens is they put it in a pile and they torch it um, or they put it in a pile and they bury it. But there's really, really no secondary use for most of this agricultural film waste. And so basically I'm taking this material, very, very high quality long chain polymers and finding that you can build homes out of them. Um, you can build islands out of them. You can build things out of them which have long-term use and they're structural, they're rigid, they're archival. And if you get the sand just right, they're really, really pretty. Um, and uh, yeah, so building these things that take nature into consideration, ways that you can bring nature onto this structure by creating these spaces where soil and plants and animals can thrive. Sorry, how are we keeping you up? Uh -huh. <laughs> What's that? Oscar, couldn't they make fencing poles with the, uh, that? I didn't see the whole thing, Oscar. So it says, he says, couldn't they make fencing poles with that plastic after use, help with fencing in cows, take them away from cutting trees for fencing poles? We kind of, you were talking about how they'd have to clean it in order to repurpose it, clean it. And, yeah. Right. A lot of these in order to melt it down, they need to have a certain amount of purity. Um, too much dirt and debris um, when they do this. I mean, there are different, I mean, it is being recycled. It's not like there's no use for it, but there's just so much fencing pole um, market out there. Um, and it does take a lot of energy to make these fencing poles. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's just an amazing amount of material. I, I mean, I could throw some numbers at you, but they're just mind boggling. Uh, I mean, the weight of the Empire State Building, that amount of plastic is produced every two and a half days. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just, there's just an amazing amount of this stuff out there. And it's, 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 there are definitely ways you can recycle it. Um, I'm just finding one other way. And it's a very simple way, and it's a very inexpensive way. There is some infrastructure necessary to figure out how to make it, um, how to utilize it, um, to how to get the sand and there's ways to efficiently manipulate and heat the sand. And you need to heat it at a fairly constant, slow temperature, but it's not rocket science to, uh, to make hot sand. Um, and my idea is to figure out ways that you can, you know, obviously if you paint, if you make it dark and you use the sun and we're not talking like ridiculously high temperatures, we're talking about 160, 170 degrees centigrade. So 300, 330 in freedom units. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it just takes a little bit of energy. Um, have you worked? like created bricks that, with this way or or is, do you think is it better to have one like coating a single sealed coating to, I think it, it really wants to just be like a, a thin layer 
-hmm. I mean, you can make, there are people, there's a woman in Nigeria making bricks. She's melting it. You could wrap something and make a brick, but I just feel like this material really lends itself well to just skinning an object and creating the whole form in one fell swoop that you can make one very large structure, watertight, no seams. You can come by later and put, you know, fenestration and doors in, or you could put them in while you're doing it, put all your sort of stuff at the same time and just bingo, bango, you got it done. You just basically dip the whole thing in hot sand. Now to get a, this all dipped in hot sand is tough, but you could do it in, in layers and just slowly add to it. But the idea is that it's one unbroken um, unit. And so there's no seams and it's very, very strong because of that. So yes, you can make bricks. You can do lots of things with it. I'm kind of going with this idea of like, it really wants to just skin over a form. Um, obviously I'm just using a flat cardboard, but it would have more of like bones, if you will, that wraps around and there's sort of joints that kind of create this superstructure that gets wrapped. Um, but that's the idea. And then while you're doing it, as I said, all the utilities are built in the HVA system, the plumbing, the electric, the lighting. So it's all done in one shot and you can do it for you know, a couple of thousand bucks, you've got yourself a really rigid structure that you can put on. I mean, I see like a, a sailboat trailer. I don't know if you've ever seen sailboats running along the road. They do, they're kind of out of their element, but you can put one of these on basically a modified sailboat trailer, drag it wherever you want, cut a little V in the ground and just drop it in. You know, I would put another one and kind of attach it so there's just two of them, so it's not going to want to tilt, but that's basically all you need. Um, and then you can have, you know, obviously you need utilities and whatnot, but it's not beyond our capabilities. I mean, I know I'm living in basically that, but with wheels. Um, well, we have uh, less than 10 minutes of our scheduled time. So last chance to ask any burning questions. Um, burning questions. Burning. <laughs> Sand burning questions. Oscar, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my name is Oscar. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I came to this uh, presentation. Um, I'm in New Jersey. Yours. And and this is a fantastic thing. Thank you for you know sharing it. I'm I'm in a different space. So my, my question is do you do you think you 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 have um I know about passion and you know putting yourself into something. Do, do you have chance to maybe pivot elsewhere? Because I'd be happy to have a conversation and, and share my thoughts. If, yeah, you know, there's that space in your time. Definitely, uh, I appreciate that. Thank um, you. I can share Oscar and P. I can share your email addresses with each other after the after the event if that works for you. Yeah, anybody I appreciate yeah, that. Works for me. Um, okay, so Frank asked if there's any chance to see a small scale prototype soon, like a one third size. One third? I'm going, this is about one eighth. This is about one eighth size, Frank. Okay. You good with this? This close enough to, to, to scale? I got my magnets. Uh, so I'm going to try to work with, with this and, and create, uh, you know, just. I mean, I'd like to get 36 of them. So give you that idea of it, of a ring, and then be able to pull the, the points in the middle for the common, and then have a, a ring on the outside too. So I'm working, I'm, they, got, they come from uh, these liquor boxes, right? So I got to drink a lot to get these things, but basically you make, you fold these things out, and you get you get one of these. Then I fold it up 
and I get one of those. So got a lot of drinking to do. <laughs> okay, Colin, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to convey your question about how many folks do you think would be housed in the system, assuming two only at the top? I don't well, know if you want to expand on that. Uh, my my apologies. Um, uh, Pete, just real quick. So you're thinking people at the top because there's more open space and we don't weigh much, and then maybe commercial, and then at the bottom, ballast and like manufacturing and facilities. Uh, yeah, I was going off a three dimensional thing, uh, the 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 rendering that you had proposed, which dude looks great. I I hadn't seen that before. <laughs> it really looks nice. Um, but I was wondering. Um, I did the math. If you assume thirty six at the surface, and then just you know permutations of plus or minus six at each stage, I got about a hundred people for what you were showing in those pictures. I yeah. think. I Do you think that's again. approximate? It's a problem. And again, it depends. Like I would say, I would start with just a single ring and see how that goes. But in the I idealation that there would be, if it has 10 stories, six of them would be underwater, four of them would be above water. Okay, six iceberg, three right. Three are used as ballast, but also aquaculture. You could be running different things under there. Um, but the, basically, it's it's ballast until it rises up. Um, I would have probably less than half of them occupied in my mind. You know, there would be utilities, there would be storage. Um, Love it. You know, bioengineering, there'd be lots of other things, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't have them all occupied. So out of 100, you know, some odd cells, probably about half of them would be occupied with people. Okay, so it's almost kind of like a, as opposed to biological trophism where everything's coming from the sun, all energy, and then all the steps are a tenth. You're looking at, you know, you, you've, you've got a different scale that is, yeah, well, let's talk about that one later on. I just, I had an idea and and how to apply that for Arcology X and then the NASA stuff we were talking about. Definitely. Yeah, thank you, dude. No, I. I, it wouldn't have popped into my head unless I'd seen this presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, it's, yeah, it's, again, it's just this idea of what we can do to create these comfortable spaces. Again, it's a lot of them, like, are, are fairly grand in scale. Um, I would like to make just one, a terrestrial-based one that's just 36 of these that's arcing out in a circle that you can create this sort of core common cave thing um, and just see how that goes and that that could be a shelter system, I mean, for quite a few people. Um, and then to see that rigidity and, and how that all plays out and how, you know, the, the growth that happens in between the cells. Um, And uh, yeah, have any other questions? No. We just well. have a couple minutes. Yeah. If if you have a final word. Um. um do, do, do you um do you, do you have volunteers or invite people to come see your work or have that opportunity? Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I, well, I used to have a studio in Brooklyn, but I gave it up. Um, I have. I'm working out of Stamford, New York, which is about three hours northwest of the city. Um, but uh, I come. I come to Jersey every now and then. Whereabouts are you? I'm. I'm in Union County, Union Township. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll get together. We'll figure we'll figure something out. Um. Okay. Yeah, I'm just sort of like, you know, you know, final word, just sort of like, I think we can really unleash the human potential. Um, and by creating these spaces where people can live as simply as possible. Um, and I know there's lots of different designs for the, uh, the um, for, for seasteading. There's lots of different iterations. And um, 
mine is one just where it's, it's it's just building a community and building an ecosystem and i see a vibrant verdant floating ecosystems um that can be made from from this and i think um, it's just, a, just trying allow me to ask i don't know whether a study has ever been done about the effect on human health living in plastic if, if we are envisioning people living there for long periods of time it's a good question. I mean, I think that it's a fairly inert substance. It's all my research, but then again, it's my research, so I'll find what I want. Um, and it's really no different than being surrounded by plastic in your in your home anyway. Um, it's also got a, a sand crust, so you're not going to really have the exposure to the plastic itself. There's a coating on it. You could paint over it if it really becomes an issue. And you can just seal off whatever that is. But I don't really see the whole sort of cooties from plastic like a lot of people see. Um, I think it's more of just a matter of there's material out there. I'm not a big fan or consider myself an apologist for the plastic industry, but it's here. Um, I would rather that it wasn't. But the fact is that there is just an enormous amount of plastic and plastic film that really is homeless so i'm just looking to find a way to create something from this really beautiful i think material that just happens to have no real utilization i'm sure th that is a question you'll you know you'll come across a lot you know with licensing and all that um from their health angle and and when you talk about plastic in the home you know we have roofs so that um, the heat doesn't, you know, maybe affect the compo right. uh, you know, composition, plastic getting into human health. But this out in the ocean, um, with climate change, and you know, you you might get a few questions. Yeah, no, I I I would hope to get questions, and I'd hope to do testing, and it might not work. There's a very good chance that we'll find out that as the sun's rays heated up, it does outgas, and it is not a viable alternative um, or not a viable product. Um, I'm going to keep running with this until someone definitely tells me it won't work, um, but I'll definitely listen to the ideas about, you know, why it won't work, um, and there's many, many things. I think that there's ways to mitigate it. Um, I think one thing I'm definitely planting on is lots of trees, lots of plants, lots of vegetation that will shade it. So the sun will not be down on it. The sun will not heat it up. And you can utilize the sun um, for growing things. And instead of it just having a flat surface that the sun will hit, you now are creating and maintaining life. So all the problems I see are actually opportunities. Well, I think that is an excellent point to end our presentation on. So thank you so much, Pete. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you. And uh, yes, Carly, you could put my email address in the chat if anybody has any questions. Um, and I guess uh, plasticrete.net is a website that has about the plasticrete. And I think I have a sea shelter website somewhere, but I haven't, I, I've, I've lost it. I'll find it though and, and send it out. Uh, but thank you everybody for coming and listening to me yammer on about um, my ideas for plasticrete. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.